Church family, I have a message that has been prepared um, for today that comes from uh, some daily cross-referencing or Bible reading that I, I just got got hung up on. I'm going to be reading uh, the first part of our message mainly from the book of Philippians chapter 1. And uh, it just intrigued me as as I've been going through these last weeks as we have not been able to come together, how much we miss each other and how much that is expressed um, in, in, in different members uh, across our, our church, whether it is our youth, whether it is our middle age, our older people are missing seeing one another and being able to talk one another face to face. And, um, you know, it, it, I'm just reminded almost every day someone calls me in the morning, sends me a text, even before I wake up and I get up early or before I go to bed at night, someone is sending an encouraging message is calling me or is just saying, hey, I miss you. I've been thinking about you. I'm praying for you. And I likewise have been going through our church and doing that same thing. I know Pastor Bill, Pastor Brad, our elders, and and really our entire church family has continued to do this, to just reach out and to look out for each other. And I encourage you, please continue that. That is the church. That's what's so wonderful about how God designed the body of Christ. We are here for one another. And it caught my attention this week as I was reading, and I just knew this is where I needed to be this morning. So I want you to read with me from the book of Philippians chapter 1 as Paul is writing a letter to the church of Philippi. Now, Paul helped establish this church some 11 years before he's actually writing this letter. And as he's writing this letter, he is in prison. He's under arrest in prison, and he's longing that he could be with one of the churches that he established, the church of Philippi, but he couldn't be with them. And although I'm not in prison and glad that I'm not, I know right now many of us feel like we're under some type of sentence because we just can't get out and get together like we normally would. But I I want you to listen to Paul's heart as, as he pins this letter to the church of Philippi. Read along with me, Philippians chapter 1, um, starting at verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hear the words that Paul is calling out to this church. It's only 11 years old, but we see it's already established. It has leaders. It has saints. It has deacons. It has the leadership in which he is calling to. And notice his message right out of the gate is grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hear that message right now. Grace be to you and peace from our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray as we get into God's Word today. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. And God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity we have right now to come together via live stream, via recording, God, and and to be able to just open up your word. And God, we know that you promise us when we open your word, when your word is read, when it is spoken, it cannot come back void. God, you're going to do something. So God, we're just excited this morning about what you're going to do with our reading of your word. I ask that that you uh, give me discernment as we continue to speak this morning. May the message that has been prepared not be of me, but may it be all of you. May there be power in this message. May it reach those it needs to reach wherever we are. And if there is someone today that does not know the love of Jesus Christ, would they hear these words in the Holy Spirit's call? And God, would you just call them home and would they receive that call? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul starts off addressing this church family. He's a long ways away. He's longing to be with them, but they can't be together. Let's look at more of his message. He goes on in verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. 
Always in every prayer of mine for you all making uh, my request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. As I, as I read Paul's words, I just have such a similar message that I think of as I read this about each one of you. How how we are missing one another right now. He starts off, I thank God every time I think of you. I thank God that, that I am able to be your pastor. I thank God that this church family, every member of this church family is unified together, this small piece of his body of Christ. I just thank God for all the things that he has done here in this body of Christ and, and who we are. I Just every time I think of you, I, I thank God for who you are. Paul goes on to say, thinking of you brings me joy. I was just, just reminiscing this week in my mind of some things that have been going on and, and uh, some of the things that are just funny, other things that are, are, are really hard. You know, they're, they just bring tears to our eyes. We, we have experienced joys together. We have experienced great triumphs together. We've also experienced pain together. But most especially, we have experienced Christ together. He goes on, thinking about you brings me joy. I can't stop thinking about you or praying for you was Paul's message to the church of Philippi. And it's my message to you today. I want you to know I've been praying for you. I have been praying for every member of our congregation, every person that comes here and is a part of our family. I've been praying for the lost. I've been praying for safety to be around us, for each one of us in every way, for the peace of God which passeth all understanding to come upon our entire church family and the church global, for God's provision to be, to be granted to each one of us. God knows exactly what we need, not always what we want, but exactly what we need when we need it. There's always a provision. I've been praying God to be our help, our help and, and comfort in a, a time of great trouble. And I want you to understand, just as Paul was saying to the church of Philippi, he says, praying for you brings me joy. I want you to know that praying for you brings me joy. I'm thankful. He goes on as we, we read this. He says, I'm thankful for your fellowship. Verse 5, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He says, from the very first time that we came together as a congregation or each member joined or came a part of this body of Christ, he says, I'm thankful for your fellowship in the gospel from then until now. Again, man, we have spent so much time together. Joys, funny experiences. Oh, our kids can make us laugh. Sometimes our adults can make us laugh. Shared sorrows. We faced sickness. We have faced trials. We've just lived together. Amen. And we're still living together now. Although temporarily, life is a little bit different. You know, there's such a love in our congregation. And that love is still here, even if we don't get to corporately come into one place on Sunday morning. We are unified in the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. We have such a spiritual growth that has been taking place in our congregation. You know, it's, it's just wonderful as a pastor to be able to say that, to say that you have truly seen where someone is stepping from being a babe in Christ to starting to grow more and more spiritually mature. God's on the move in this congregation. Don't you forget it for one minute. Where we are right now and the stress, the tribulation that's happening all around us, remember God is here. He is with us. We are part of the body of Christ. The church is not the building. The church is each one of us wherever we are. That's what his word says. We are the hands and the fingers and the, the arms and the legs. We are the complete body of 
Christ. No matter what our surroundings, there's a promise that we see. Paul was confident in verse 6, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful to know that no matter what, when we first came to God through Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in God through what his son accomplished on the cross, through Jesus Christ, what God started with us on that day, he is faithful to fulfill it, to complete that work in each of us. Oh, I love that part of our church, knowing that God is continuing to complete the work in each one of us as he has promised. Application number one, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 and 8, as we read, Even as it is meet for me to think of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds, remember Paul's in prison, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. He's separated, but there's this great love he has all unified in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul was in prison where he couldn't be with his church family. We're all gathered at different locations right now as we're watching this. But you know what? We're still all together, unified in the Spirit of Christ. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 3 says this. It says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This was a message given to the church. Keep the unity of the Spirit. We are unified in the Spirit. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says this. If there be any consolation of Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit... If any um, bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being in one accord of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. We're unified together by the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. We're unified in the love of God through Jesus Christ. We're unified in the acts and works of love that God has called us to do. And even though, again, we're not in a building together, I know that that is still happening through each one of you in our communities, and I love you for it. Application number two. We are unified in the name of Jesus Christ through the fellowship of His Holy Spirit. No matter where we are today, we are unified through the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul goes on to say that he longs for each of the saints in the name of Christ. I want you to know I long. I can't wait for that time. I've been playing it in my mind already what the celebration is going to be when we all come to, back together in one place, not just one time. You, you mark my words. We're going to have a celebration the day we come back together in our corporate worship. You know, Paul goes on after this say, and he goes into a prayer. And I want to read this, verses 9 through 11. He tells them about how much he misses this congregation, how he longs to be with them. And then he goes into this prayer. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. This is Paul's prayer. He's saying, I'm praying for you. Specifically, these are the things that I'm praying for. Verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So Paul prays here. I want us to take a look at this, this prayer for just a minute. The church of Philippi was a loving church. 
they had had sent out gifts to Paul. They had they had had tried to take care of things that God had called the church to do. They were not necessarily a rich church. They were a church under oppression. They were going through a very hard time. But even in their hard time, they continued to do the work that God had called all of the church to do. They were a loving congregation. And Paul says, even though, or says, even though you're a loving congregation, my prayer is that your love is going to grow more and more, that it's going to abound even more and more. This church is a loving church. My prayer is that your love will abound even more and more in knowledge and in judgment. Now, this word knowledge, we commonly think we see knowledge, we think it means book sense and understanding of the word. But if we look at the, the Greek translation of this word, it is epinosis. It doesn't just mean a knowledge that we learn from reading the scripture. It is an experiential knowledge. It is a knowledge that comes from experience with God. Paul understands what this is. He has lived that himself. He has been grown from a babe, becoming more and more spiritually mature himself, all through this knowledge, this epinosis, this, this knowledge that comes from experience with God. And he's praying that the church would grow even more in love from this experience that they would have with God. And he goes on in knowledge and in judgment. That's discernment, to be able to rely upon the Holy Spirit. You know, let me ask you this. Where is it that we experience God the most? It's in suffering. In the book of Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 14, it says this, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit or allowed us to receive a spirit of adoption. We are the sons and daughters of God, and with that comes great promises. You know, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So Paul's prayer, as he's praying for the church of Philippi, he's praying that their love would, would grow more and more in experience with God. He's praying that their love would have more and more discernment with the Holy Spirit's lead, leading. You know, in this current time of our distress, as we're all facing trying times, it's important for us to be praying in love for guidance and discernment from God through his Holy Spirit. Application number three, pray daily for our church family to grow more and more in love, in experience with God, and in discernment through the Holy Spirit. What does this look like? What does that look like to grow more and more in experience with God? What does it look like to grow more and more in love? You know, if we, we go back to the book of Philippians, it says in, in verse number 10, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent. That's that we would pray for God to give us experience, his leading, his discernment that we would know how to approve things that are excellent. It goes further in that verse, that our love would be without offense until the day of Christ, that our love, as it grows, would grow more and more sincere. In verse 11, that we would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. 
What are the fruits of righteousness? That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. If we go back just a couple of books to Galatians chapter 5, we see uh, wording about the Holy Spirit and the fruits of righteousness. He says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And if we go further in verse 22 through 25, Galatians 5, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. Fruits of the Spirit. That's what it looks like. Application number four. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, we show the glory and praise of of God. Look at verse 11 back in Philippians. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, and when we're doing this, unto the glory and praise of God. And then as we continue reading in Philippians 1, verse 12 through 14. But I would, would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. These terrible events that were happening to Paul, he says, hey, know that the gospel has gone even further because of these events. So that in my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace, in all the other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident in my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul is saying in the turmoil, in the world falling apart where he was, in him being locked away in prison, he was able to touch more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. More people were talking about Christ. More people were bold in talking about Christ. And I'm here to tell you today, if you've been looking around any at all, you see in these troubling times that we're in, there's more people on social media talking about God and Jesus Christ than we've probably seen in the last decade. There are sermons galore. You can just find sermons all over the internet right now. All this preaching and teaching is being done and people are grabbing and listening to it and lives are being changed. Christ is being proclaimed. Even in the midst of the suffering we're in, Christ is being proclaimed. Most importantly, we see here that the Holy Spirit is calling people to himself. There are people out right now that don't know what to make of what's going on. They don't know where to put their trust. They're looking for answers. What is it that I believe in? What is this all about? And somewhere the Holy Spirit is calling them. And it's aligning with God's word that you are more bold to proclaim. And people are coming to the Lord. You see, just like Paul's example, we need to pray for people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior to answer the call of the Holy Spirit and put their trust and faith in the only thing that will bring them real peace, and that's Jesus Christ. Let's look again what Paul was praying for. Philippians 1, verses 9 through 12. He says in verse 9, I'm praying that your love would grow more and more, that you would grow in your experience with God, that you would grow in your discernment from God through His Spirit's presence in your life, that you would be true in your love, sincere until the day Christ returns, that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit so much that the fruits of the Spirit would be evident in your life. That was Paul's prayer for the church he loved. And it's my prayer for you. Paul says in verse 12 through 14, when we're facing tribulation, when we're facing distress, it appears that the world is falling apart. Christ would be preached and God would be glorified. You know, right now, the time we're living in, right now, today, this is a time for people to come to know Jesus Christ.
James chapter 1 gives us a little bit of insight in, into how do you take turmoil and, and, and how, do we, how do we, through God's Word, bring reason to all the things that are taking place. And he says this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. He's saying, count it all joy when your world's falling apart. Count it all joy when you don't understand the things that are happening around you, when you're facing tribulation and distress. James is saying, hey, count it joy. Why? He says in verse 3, knowing this, that while you're in this place, the trying of your faith works patience. As our faith is tried, as we rely and we lean on God and more, uh, God more and more in our prayer time and in our meditation, He reveals Himself to us. Patience is grown in us. Experience of relying on God is grown. He says this in verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's that experience in love that we grow in Christ. And he goes on in verse 5, when you still don't understand what's going on, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraided not, and it shall be given unto you. Count it all joy when we fall into tribulation. Application number 5. It is in tribulation and distress that we are forced to take our minds off the things of this world and focus on the things of God. Romans 8, 28 and 29 tell us that, that um, God works all things for good for those that love God who are called according to His purpose. And in verse 29, it says that, that the reason of that, how God works all things for good, even the, the trials and tribulations, the sufferings of our life, is we're slowly being conformed to the image of Christ. That's that patience. Let patience have His perfect work. You know, tribulation is a time, again, for people to come to know the love of Jesus Christ. Things happen spiritually when trials and tribulations come. I'm going to close in a passage in the book of Acts. And, and uh, don't worry, I'm not closing this second. We still got a few more minutes. But I want you to go back with me in the book of Acts to Acts chapter 16. I told you that the church of Philippi was founded some 11 years earlier. I want you to see how that was founded. Real quickly, we're going to just look at part of this scripture. I encourage you to read all of chapter 16. But go with me to, to chapter 16 of the book of Acts, and we're going to see how Paul runs into certain individuals and what God does to, to first form the church of Philippi, this church that Paul loves so much. So in uh, Acts chapter 16, read along with me, verses 6 through 12. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Paul wanted to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him go. After that, verse 7, they were come to, to Mysia and assayed in Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. He wanted to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit led him. He had this experience with God. The Holy Spirit said, this is not where you should be. Verse 8, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately... We endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering to the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came to the straight course of Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. Paul was planning on going somewhere else and seeing other people as he was on his second missionary journey. And we see the Holy Spirit stopped him and changed his direction. The Holy Spirit again stopped him and changed his direction until Paul ended up in Philippi. It was the Holy Spirit's leading. 
Now, let's look at what happens as we go a little bit further. Verse 13 through 15. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by the riverside where prayers were wont to be made, and we sat down and spoken to the woman which restored or resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart in the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you had judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So I want you to see what takes place here. Her heart was opened. Paul sees her. He goes over and he's, he's talking about God. She hears this communication. The Holy Spirit calls her. What happens? She receives Jesus Christ. She's baptized into the church. So much so, she says, Paul, uh, you and Silas, come to my house. Now, as Paul is continuing to preach, there's, there's a, a troubled uh, young lady that continues coming around. Scripture is going to describe her as being possessed or being uh, full of evil. And she just keeps on, everywhere Paul is preaching, she keeps saying that he is the man of the Most High God, the man of the Most High God. And Paul finally confronts her in this evil spirit, and he casts the evil spirit out. Well, you would think that's a good thing. But the men that made money off of her were upset. So what did they do? They go and complain to the leaders and they throw Paul and Silas in prison. Go with me to verse 23 and we will come to our conclusion. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now think about this. Paul is going about doing what God's called him to do. He's following the leading of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he started going the wrong place. The Holy Spirit turned him twice. He finds himself here. Someone accepts the Lord. And the next thing that happens when he's doing all the things right is he's accused of taking away someone's profit. He's beaten and he's thrown in prison. You know, what did he do? What would you do in this situation? What is it that we do in the tribulation that we're in right now? Do we cry and say, God, I don't understand. Why'd you leave me? Why'd you allow this to happen? Let's look at Paul's example. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, they were beaten and thrown in the inner court of the prison. They prayed and they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Do you see what Paul's example was? In tribulation. He prayed. He sung praises to God. What happens, verse, uh, excuse me, application number six. Right now in our distress and tribulation, we need to pray and sing praises to God. When we're in tribulation, pray and sing praises to God. Verse 26, what happens when believers pray? And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Did you, did you see that? Can you imagine this? People heard Paul and Silas pray and singing. It's a positive witness to unbelievers. That's what unbelievers would see us right now doing as we pray in the midst of everything that's going on. We pray and we sing praises to God people hear that prayer. You know what else happens? God shows up. Here, God showed up in a mighty earthquake, an earthquake that made, made their, their handcuffs fall to the ground, that made the prison doors open. You know what happened then? They were freed from their bondage. In tribulation, when God's people pray and sing praises, he hears those prayers and he intervenes. God shows up. We're released from our bondage, the bondage of fear. We're freed from it. If our bondage is substance abuse, we can be freed from it. If our bondage is pornography or adultery or some type of immoral lifestyle, we can be freed from all of our sin. When God's people pray, when we call out to God, other people see it. God intervenes. He shows up. Bondages are removed. We are freed. And people are saved. If you go with me, verse 27 through 31. 
the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm, for we're all here. Paul and them didn't leave. There he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. When God's people pray, God shows up. We're freed from our bondage, and people are saved. You may be asking, what do I need to do if I'm not saved? To be freed from the bondage of sin in my life. Listen to verse 31 again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy shall be saved, and thy house. The Philippian jailer spoken of here, and Lydia, the seller of purple we just talked about, they were the first converts and founding members of the church of Philippi. Paul was taken after being led by the Holy Spirit, doing what he should do. He was taken, he was beaten, he was put in prison. Tribulation was all around him. His world was falling apart. But he, what, what was his response to this? He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He didn't say, woe is me. He prayed and he sang praises to God in tribulation. What happened? People who were unbelievers heard. God showed up, an earthquake came. People were freed from the bondage that they were in. Their chains fell off, and people were saved. Thus, the church of Philippi that Paul loved so much was started. You know, it's in our distress that God has the opportunity to do the most amazing things. And as the first part of the, the book of Philippi, the first part of the message, Paul was expressing his love for the church. That even in that time of distress where Paul was in prison, he says, I love you. I'm praying for you to grow more and more in love and, and experience with God and discernment of the Holy Spirit. And that's my prayer for you. Paul also understood that in that tribulation, verses 12 through 14, the book of Philippians chapter 1, that people would be saved, that Christ would be proclaimed even more and more. And here we are today in 2020 in tribulation. The world is falling apart all around us. Know you're loved. You're loved by your pastor. We know we're loved by each other. We're a loving, wonderful congregation. But it is not a time for us to hide away in fear. We are not slaves to fear. God has given us the power of a sound mind. And it's our time to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To pray and to pray boldly. Proclaiming anywhere and everywhere we can. To sing praises to God in this time of distress. God's going to show up. People are going to be loosed from their bonds. People are going to be saved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We just love you, God. I thank you for this message that you've given us today. And God, as it's laid upon my heart, if there is somebody today that just doesn't put it all together, they don't understand, but your Holy Spirit's calling them right now. They don't know why, but they, they just continue to listen to this message. They don't know you. They may know about you, but they don't know you. But they've listened today, and your Spirit has called them, God. And they're just wondering, how do I get this peace that's talked about? How do I lose this fear of all the things that are going on? It is to come to a relationship with you, God, and you tell us that sin separates us from you. But you've made a way for that separation to be removed all through what you did in sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to teach us how to live, to ultimately die as the last sacrifice, for our sins so all of our sins could be forgiven not because we deserved it but because you loved us so much that is mercy and grace and that God you are, you raised him from the dead three days later he defeated death he has overcome this world and that through our faith and belief in Jesus Christ accomplishing these things for us on the cross we can be in a right relationship with you 
God, if that's an individual listening today, I just ask you, God, allow your spirit's call to soften their heart. And may they just say today, God, I believe you're real. I believe you love me. I know I'm broken. I'm a sinner. God, forgive me of my sins. God, I trust in you. I trust in Jesus Christ. I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And God, forgive me of all of my sins. Save me from this day forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, if God's doing something in your life, would you reach out to us? Would you contact us? Would you give us a call? Let me talk to you about the love of Jesus Christ. Church, I love you. God bless you.